Obrigado, professor Kellner. Após a, a, a fala do, do professor Osborne, eu vou convidar o professor Kellner para voltar aqui para frente e a gente vai ter chance de, de conversar um pouco, de, de responder algumas perguntas. É, queria, então, é, apresentar o professor Jonathan Osborne, é, que é graduado em Física pela Universidade de Bristol, pós-graduado em Educação pela Universidade de Cambridge, mestre em Astrofísica pelo Queen Mary College da Universidade de Londres e PhD em Educação pelo King's College, também da Universidade de Londres. Atualmente, o professor Osborne é professor na Universidade de Stanford. É, professor? O professor Osborne vai falar em inglês. Se alguém precisar de aparelho de tradução, eles estão lá fora. as well uh, and uh, so I'll try and speak slowly so that hopefully the translators can keep up uh, with what I have to say uh, I'm going to talk about something rather different which is this whole issue of engaging young people with stem subjects uh, which has been a kind of interest uh, that I've done research on and have studied now for uh, I think over 20 years uh, in that sense uh, I don't have uh, what I would call the specific answers. I'm going to raise lots of issues uh, and I think point to what we do know about things that are effective in that way. First thing I'm going to start with is this issue of is there a problem? What is the nature of the problem that we are confronting here? And this very much depends upon who you listen to. Uh, if you listen to scientists, for instance, they write documents like this. This is a document produced by the National Academies of Sciences called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. It's full of doom-laden portents which say things like this. Last year, more than 600,000 engineers graduated from the institutions of higher education in China compared to 350,000 in India and just a mere 70,000 in the United States. Okay. Or chemical companies last year shut 70 facilities in the United States and marked 40 for closure of 120 large chemical plants under construction globally. One is in the United States and 50 are in China. So it's sort of you know, set up to worry people about this means that we are losing the global economic race. They published this one in 2005. And they thought people weren't listening, so they published another one in 2010 called Rising Above the Gathering Storm Revisited. Uh, I think the answer is actually people are listening. This is a, the issue we're talking about here is the sense that STEM education is vital for the economy, but it supplies, it's a, the pipeline metaphor, it supplies the future generation of scientists and technologists. And you can see it not just in America, you can see it as well uh, in the context of Europe. This is a document called Europe Needs More Scientists. Uh, you see it in my own country, which is the UK, where it's put very starkly as being a race to the top. Now, the only thing that worries me about this is, yes, it is the function of science education and math education to educate people uh, for uh, uh, what you might call for work. But I, the, my concern is that actually that means that the educational function, you know, what is really the, what you might call building that sense of understanding of the world, sometimes gets lost. Now, this is the other reason why uh, uh, people are very concerned about this. And this comes out of uh, the work of a colleague of mine at Stanford, a man called Eric Hanischek. What Eric Hanischek does is he plots, if I can get this to work, he plots... Uh, the, the test scores on th these international tests, PISA, uh, TIMS, I and IEA, going back to the 1960s, and he plots them against the growth. They're, they're called, he's, he's adjusted them, which is why it's called conditional thing. Uh, and he gets this rather wonderful regression line between growth and test scores. Uh, and you can see countries like Singapore and Taiwan are up there, uh, and uh, other countries... Uh, down here are not doing so well. In fact, I think Brazil, I did mark Brazil, uh, is there. <laughs> and, and, but you are above the line. <laughs> so 
So look at it. Look at it. This is the good news. Okay, right, from that point of view. Okay, uh, as opposed to other countries which are beneath the line. But his argument basically is that if you can improve your test scores, okay, by and only not a large amount, your growth will improve, improve dramatically. Now this again is a wonderful study. For uh, you know, is it causal or is it correlational? And if it's causal, which way is it? But nevertheless, it gets a lot of attention because he then goes on to argue, how do you improve your, um, your test scores? And you improve that by improving the quality of teaching, to which I'll return later on. But, and this is the kind of but I think you have to put into it, which is that this is where you get to what you call uh, the, you know, the demand, or the, where the su issue of supply turns into demand. Do you, you know, do we really need more scientists? So, for instance, this is the supply of biomedical PhDs in the U.S. And the blue line is the supply, and the green line is the number of tenure-track positions, which stays flat. And definitely in the U.S., if you happen to be a biomedical PhD, getting any kind of full-time employment is very difficult. You end up being a postdoc, even at Stanford, for many years before you will get employment. So the answer is that it's in certain subjects when it comes to this pipeline issue that we are short, not all sciences. And so you have to be somewhat careful uh, ab about it. Uh, if you look at the, this is, I know, going back quite a way now, but I, I did check it, it hasn't changed r rapidly. In terms of the production of PhDs, the only one that's changed significantly since this set of data is China where they're now producing something like 40,000 PhDs per year. And it gives you the number of STEM, STEM ones overall. And the question is, where is the shortest line? Does it lie in the production of PhDs? Does it lie in the production of graduates? Or does it just simply lie in the people who are educated with a high school diploma or its equivalent, are interested in taking up technical jobs? And it very much depends. If you talk to, for instance, people from Boeing in the US, their problem is what you might call a lack of people who can take a plan and take something and put it together, which is at a lower level. So the issue, I think, is uh, when it comes to supply, is at what level are we actually short of people? Again, this is another graph which I think raises questions about supply. Uh, again, to explain it, what it is, uh, it needs a bit of explaining. It's, it's scientists' salaries compared to other professions. This comes from uh, a book, Is American Science in Decline? Uh, the scientists' salaries are this blue line here. They're, they're, they're all normalized to one. And you can see that many other professions over the years have done significantly better than scientists. And that says something about the demand in that sense. Engineers have done better. Um, the, uh, social scientists have done better in that sense. The only people that have done worse are teachers, which again says something about a society that if we value education that much, why are we not prepared to pay uh, due to uh, its socioeconomic uh, background? Uh, and that basically says you're a fairly uh, unequal society. I want to go on to this, though. This is something slightly different, which is the relationship between science attainment and attitudes. This is out of the TIMS, uh, which is the Trends in Mathematics and Science Study, which is done every four years, and other these international tests. And what you've got plotted here at the bottom is their average science score. But they also give these students an attitude towards science test. It's full of things like, I like school science, uh, uh, those kinds of questions all the time. And this is an issue that I think uh, those of us uh, thinking about formal science education have to think about quite ha hard, which is that basically, if you look at this, it's not obvious, but there's a kind of regression line that goes like that. And this keeps coming up. What it basically says is that those countries that do better on TIMS, such as my own country, England, down there, with a high score, okay, have students who basically have a low attitude towards science. The worse your students do, the more positive they are about science. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, what is, the, what is going on there? And why is that happening in that way? And is it something that's intrinsic to the system or the education system? Or is it something which is the nature of the society? You see the same kind of thing in this 
uh, analysis, which was done by a Norwegian. The study was called ROSE, which stood for Relevance of Science Education. He gave students lots of questions like this. I like school science better than most other school subjects. It's not a very, what I would call, rigorous study, but it still gets very interesting results in the sense that uh, these are all the countries he did. And, you, and the, the scale is down there at the bottom. Uh, in that sense, one is, no, I don't like it at all. Four is, I really do like it. And you can see that what you're seeing is that the less developed countries have a much more positive attitude towards science. And you will see some of that, again, in some other data that I'll show you for Brazil. So what you're, that's what you're seeing there. And the other thing is that the blue are, are the average for the boys and the red for girls. And what you're also seeing there is that in many countries, girls seem to dislike science uh, more than the boys on average. And that's a particular concern, I think, because what you have in most advancing societies is that women are reaching higher levels of education than boys, and are there a large number of them that are missing out from uh, their, their possible opportunities? Now, there are interesting things that come out of this kind of data, and I'd like to show you this one, because I think it, it's very simple, but it points to an issue that I think school science education has to deal with. Uh, this is English data, actually. Uh, that Rose survey has 108 items in it of things you might like to learn about. And as a person taking the survey, you just have to rate them uh, and what you get. Now, there are 80 statistically significant differences between boys and girls. What do you get for the boys? You get this list. These are the top five. Okay, explosive chemicals, how it feels to be weightless in space, how the atomic bomb functions, biological and chemical weapons. Okay, and all it sort of raises is the question of what is it about the male of the species that they're so obsessed with death and destruction? The question, of course, is what do you get for the girls? And it's a very different list. Okay. Why are we dreaming when we're sleeping? What dreams may mean? Cancer, what we know and how to treat it, how best to perform first aid and use basic medical equipment, okay, how to exercise to keep the body fit and strong. It's all concerned with the body and health and care. And my question, I think, that what the question it raises for me and hopefully for you, is which of those concerns does science education address more? Those lists of interests or those lists of interests? And if you want to engage girls, you have to think about addressing those lists of interests uh, more. Uh, in that sense. Uh, and how we do that, again, I think is an interesting question. And from that point of view, though, if you look at the um, PISA data, this is PISA data again, uh, gender differences in performance between girls and boys, uh, Brazil is not as bad as many of the advanced countries from that point of view. It's only a small difference, which says that in some senses that at least um, you're doing a reasonable job of educating uh, girls, although obviously we could all improve because uh, there's a bottom half of this graph where girls do better than boys as well. Okay. Uh, in terms of proportion, this is again out of piece of data. Proportion of boys and girls planning a career in engineering or computer computing. Uh, you can see what's happening here. Uh, you've got the OECD average, which is there. Um, uh, the yellow is boys. Many more boys are interested in it than girls. But again, from Brazil, you're about average in that sense, not doing too badly compared to the average, but, and this is the concern I think we have, that if, like me, you tend to think that you maximize your career opportunities by doing science subjects, okay, the fact that there's a lack of interest, or that, only that small percentage, about 7% of girls are interested in that, is that they're closing lots of future career opportunities uh, for themselves. And this, again, is a constant kind of issue about how do we do more about that? The answer to some extent is this is a long-term project. This is a set of data that comes out of the American Association for uh, University Women uh, of the number of people getting bachelor's degrees from 1966 to 2006 in the different sciences, which are down here. And you can see that uh, in terms of the biological sciences, now more than 50% um, of women. 
but all of them have been going up apart from computer science. And that's a particular problem in, around Silicon Valley where I, uh, I come from, uh, which is very male dominated as well. But, but this has taken time, it's taken a lot of initiatives, nobody knows ex exactly what the answer to this is in that sense, but all you can say is that we are going in the right direction, but it's going to take a long time and it's something that we have to persist at uh, constantly if we're going to improve it, uh, particularly in computer science. Uh, this is something else which I think really raised the last talk, which is that we don't just engage with science in the classroom. We also experience science in many of these other kinds of ways, and PISA has, uh, it does this big questionnaire which students have to fill in, telling, saying how often they do these kinds of things. Uh, and then what it does is it builds an index of what it calls science-related activities. And I've only put up there a few countries. Uh, UK, for instance, the mean is not minus 0.35. Uh, boys is minus 0.25. And girls, it's worse, it's minus 0.45. So it's not very good from that point of view. Germany is sort of about the middle. Brazil, interestingly, is quite positive. And I, why that is, I you, only you can t tell me from that point of view. But it seems that uh, young people here engage in these kinds of activities more than they do in the UK and Germany. So there's obviously something positive going on there uh, in the way in which young people are interested or in, will engage with science in, in, in that kind of way. Uh, and that's, again, I think relates to the last talk, which is an important factor we need to bear in mind, which is illustrated by this graph, uh, which is that uh, in terms of, if you take, th this is a graph basically of our lifetime from birth until death, and this bit here in the middle is the amount of time that we spend in formal education. Now, even when you're in school, only 18.5% of your 16 waking hours is actually spent in formal education. Yes, they're very significant, but there are all kinds of experiences that we are now having outside of school where much of the interest, the engagement of, with, with science occurs, and those are important opportunities. And they're also, as I'll show you, important influences. And how do we, in some senses, uh, maximize the experience that people have of science and the opportunity to engage uh, and interest people? And that, I think, is illustrated well by that graph. It's the blue space. We tend to focus on the orange space, but there's also things happening out there uh, as well. This, I show this one simply because this is an, a question I, uh, that you have to think about. Some people see this as being a, a, a you know, glass half empty one case. Yeah, but the question I ask is, is it really glass half full? In these surveys, these road surveys, you get these kinds of questions. I would like to become a scientist. I like school science better than other subjects. School science is interesting. Okay. Well, you can see, I'd like to become a scientist, not very many. If you add those two together, uh, in, in, in that sense, you're getting nearly 80, uh, 79, um, 39%. Okay. Four-fifths of people, no. Now, some people say that's terrible. Okay. What are we doing wrong? But actually, 20% of the student cohort being interested in becoming a scientist, that's not bad. Okay. I mean, we need a whole range of people in that sense. So, is it that negative in that sense uh, and is, uh, again where should we really be focusing our efforts on if we're worried about the pipeline should we really be identifying those people and focusing on those people who would like to become a scientist well, at that age which in this case is about age 15 or should we be trying to spend more effort into moving these people into that group uh, and those again I think are questions that uh, everybody tries to uh, wrestle with in, in that way. Okay, so that then takes you on to this question. Uh, how do you interest more people in science? How do we engage more people? What do we know about that? Well, the first thing we know, and this comes from study after study after study that has been done since the uh, mid-19th century, is that okay, most people's interest in science develops at a young age. This is a slide done by the Royal Society in England asking over a thousand scientists 
at what age they first became interested in science or had the feeling that this was something they were going to pursue. And you can see 28% are saying under 11, 35% between 12 and 14, and then the rest after that. So the message of this is that if you want to engage people in science and you've got sparse resources and most of us have, it's better to focus on these age groups or even younger okay, than it is on the older age groups. I mean, don't, don't abandon the older age groups altogether because there are some people who come in after that. But that is quite important. Now, this comes through particularly, and this takes a bit of explaining, in this study. This is the best data for this. This is an American study done using uh, a set of data called the National Educational Longitudinal Study, starting in 1988. They asked eighth graders okay, what kind of degree they thought they would be getting. And they divided them into two groups, eighth graders who were expecting a science degree and eighth graders who said they weren't expecting a science degree. And then they went back whenever it is, 12, 13 years later, and said, what degree did you actually get? Now, the eighth graders who are expecting a science degree are plotted here. What baccalaureate, what degree did they get? Against their math achievement score. Those who were expecting a... Uh, if you take the high-scoring mathematician group, those who said they were expecting to get a science degree here, add these two together, which is the physical science and engineering, and the life sciences, okay, over 60% of them got an actual science degree. Drops off a bit as, you, as the math score gets down, but even, even with a kind of median math score, which is 45, okay, more than 50% of them who said they were going to get a science degree actually did get a, a science degree. As opposed to the group okay, who said they were not expecting a science degree, okay, where if you said you were not expecting a science degree and you had a high math, math score, okay, well, 30% of them did actually get a uh, degree of that nature, a science degree. So it sort of points to the fact that actually people have a pretty good gut feeling by the time they're 14, 13, 14, about what interests them. And the question is, how do we develop that kind of interest. Um, there's another piece of data here, which is again quite interesting, which is what's the probability of getting a degree in sciences and how does it relate to your mathematics achievement? And I think this is an important thing about mathematics, uh, which is often, it depends, it very, the attitude toward mathematics varies from society to society, but uh, it, it, in a lot of Anglo-Saxon countries it's just seen as being problematic. But what you see here is this is your mathematics achievement score at grade 8. And the higher your mathematics achievement score, the probability of you getting a physical science degree goes up significantly in, in that sense. Whereas if it's uh, a li your life sciences bears not much relationship to your mathematics score. So if your concern, what does this say? If your concern is the supply of physical scientists and engineers, then in some sense one of the things might, you might need to do is to think about how do we improve the interest, not in science, but in mathematics and the teaching of mathematics. Because these are all, what you might say, relationships. The causal nature of them is difficult to actually unpick. But undoubtedly, I think the teaching of mathematics is an issue, particularly when it comes to physical sciences and engineering. If you think you're not much good at mathematics, you're probably going to be put off physical sciences and engineering in that kind of way. And then you come to the teaching. And the teaching, I think, is a big issue when it comes to formal science education. And I could go into this at length, but I'll just try and stick to what I think are a few highlights. Uh, this is a survey done in the UK about, again, how students said they like to learn science. And this is sense. They like to learn it. These are top things. In groups, by doing practical things, with friends, by using computers. These are the things that would make it interesting for them. Okay. Then, of course, they were asked, how do you learn science? Okay. And this is what they said. Okay. Copying from a board or book. And you do have to ask, okay, why is it that the teaching of science is so reliant on that, particularly these days when you can easily get the information uh, by looking it up? 
and it'll be better quality. As somebody once said, copying is a means by which the notes of the lecturer become the notes of the student without going through the minds of either. And you really do have to think about that. Listen to the teacher talking for a long time. Have a class discussion. So one of the big issues coming out of this is how do you shift, in that sense, the nature of the educational experience that students are being offered by science teachers uh, in that kind of way. Uh, this is something else. Okay. Uh, teachers were asked what they thought were the most important scientific discoveries. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, science is communicating. And this is their list. Now, my question to you, just this is a kind of interactive exercise, but just turn to your partner and said, if you ask the students the same question, and the students were asked the same question, okay, what would be the top of their list? Okay, just give you 30 seconds to turn to your partner and say, what do you think would be the top of their list? Let's see how well, you understand, uh, uh, how well you understand your students. Okay, this is the list for students. Okay. Uh, okay, 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 okay. And it's, the emphasis is on technology. Okay, okay. okay. The telephone comes low because this was actually done, I'm showing you some rather old data. People did this, did this in 1994. Okay. I, I would love somebody to redo the study again, but nobody has redone it. But I think it would be much higher now. Okay, okay. Uh, but there is an issue here, I don't think it would be that different, which is that their interest is in technology in the world around them, and what they're getting is the first list I showed you. And the good teacher of science makes the connection between those two. And making that connection is really quite hard and something that you have to spend quite a lot of time uh, thinking about uh, in that kind of way. Uh, and again, this is just another... I'm raising a lot of issues in that sense, that's all I can do in the time. I've got, okay, so then you come to the teaching of science. Now, I think this is what I'm seeing as being the problems, having watched it and studied it a lot of the time. There's a particular emphasis on performance learning. Okay, not mastery. By performance learning, I mean it's the kind of learning you do, like I had to do when I went to California. I've got to pass the driving test. So the night before, I sit down with a book, and I learn up all the answers, and I reproduce them the next day, and I can't tell you one, okay? Apart from... The one which I did from basic physics principles, which I have to remember to this day. Okay? Okay. What we want is to produce situations, to produce mastery learning. Performance learning is particularly pervasive where you have high-stakes assessment. I don't know whether you have that here in Brazil, but it's a particular problem in a lot of Anglo-Saxon countries in that kind of way. And one of our issues in the States, and we're about to start a new project on this hopefully, is how do we de develop assessments that assess deep understanding as opposed to superficial recall uh, and memory. There's an over-reliance on transmission. Unfortunately, the standard pedagogic model that most of us inherit from sitting in classrooms is an idea that teaching is a form of one-way communication. Okay. And as a forgetting, I think, that actually... It's the student that has to do the work to do the, the learning. And how do you set that up? Just broadcasting it or just repeating it is not going to help. And this means that you get too much teacher talk, too much of this copying, which is, doesn't know how helpful. It becomes repetitious, as one student just said to me. Well, you do photosynthesis in the elementary school, then you do photosynthesis in the middle school, and then you do it again okay, in the high school. And that is a problem. And there's a lack of space for discussing ideas. Students want to discuss these in that kind of way. So how do you get around that? And it's this dominance of recall, which fundamentally I think is unchallenging. One of the reasons I think a lot of bright students give up on science is because actually they find nothing that's sufficiently challenging. Okay. Yes, there's lots to remember, but there's something that they actually want to make them think, and it's the, a lack of making them think. Uh, and that comes out of some work we did. 
uh, back about 10 years ago. Now, the big message about te teaching and the importance of teaching comes from this particular book. It's done by a New Zealander called John Hattie. This is the book that uh, a lot of policymakers have paid attention to over the years, uh, to the extent that, um, as a colleague of mine was explaining, when this man appears in Germany, he gets an audience with the Minister of Education. Because what he's done is he's done 800 meta-analyses. That means that basically what he's done is he's looked at all the research on one topic that satisfies certain criteria, and then he's analyzed those to see what is the message that comes from all of those research studies. And he's expressed those uh, in terms of what he calls an effect size, which is a quantitative measure of how big that particular effect is. And these are all the things that have big effect sizes. Quality of teaching, 0.77. That's a significant, you know, substantive effect size. Okay, in that sense. Reciprocal teaching, which is a particular teaching technique, 0.74. Teacher-student relationships, the quality of those. Providing feedback to students, 0.72. Those are all the things with top effect sizes and all, in point, all, the, all the things that the teacher's got control over. What a lot of teachers will argue, and some people will argue, is it's the working conditions that matter. Within class grouping, adding more finances, reducing class size, and putting them into ability groups. And unfortunately for those kinds of arguments, the research says no. The effect sizes there are positive, but they're small uh, in that sense. So the issue that this is pointing to is how, as a system, can you improve those factors? Because if you put your money into doing that, you're not really going to see, as the Americans would say, much bang for your buck. Okay. You will do if you can do that. And that, I think, is particularly true in the case of science education uh, in that kind of way. Uh, the other thing I think to point to in terms of engaging young people is that they are not a homogenous group. And that's a mistake. This is a work done by a researcher called Helen Haste, uh, looking at students and science and the role of science in the future. And she identified four groups of students. She what called the green, which were younger girls under 16 who would be interested in a job related to science because of its environmental or e ecological aspect to it. The techno investor, okay, these are boys under 16 who are just fascinated by technology in that kind of way, uh, in a sense. Science-oriented, that's boys over 16 who have just an intrinsic interest in science. There are, fortunately, some of them out there in that kind of way. And then there are the alienated from science, the ones that you're never going to reach, in a, as the English would say, in a month of Sundays. Uh, uh, but they tend to be young women. Okay. So, again, in terms of the audience, it's not a homogenous group. Do you want to target specific audiences? Because it will be uh, better to do that. Or do you want to uh, address all, all of them? And you see this again. This is some research that uh, I and my colleagues have been doing at King's College the past five years, looking at aspirations in science and its relationship to attitudes. We've measured their aspirations by giving them surveys, saying what kinds of things do you want them to do. And you get a kind of pretty uh, wonderful normal distribution. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this to some extent is that there's a large negative group there, but there's also a kind of uh, larger positive group in that kind of way. So it is, there's a big spread of interest or aspirations in science in that kind of way. Uh, and what are the factors that have had the biggest effect on those aspirations in that sense from our research? Well, it's not gender, okay, in, in that sense, but it is, okay, in that sense, these two factors down here, your attitude towards school science, so schools, this is pointing to the fact that if you, you know, again, is it a cause or is it a correlation? We don't know. But if you have got a positive attitude towards school science, your aspirations are likely to be higher. And if your parents have a positive attitude towards science. And this again keeps coming up in the literature, that a lot of the people who go into science, particularly women, have parents who work in science. Okay? Basically, they expose them to what it's about. They give them or show them why it has meaning and value in their lives, and therefore people follow on in that particular area. I mean, I find at Stanford, for instance, I get engineering graduates coming to me occasionally because they're getting a bit fed up with engineering. And if they're women, 
You ask them what got you interested in science, and it's always a family story. So how do you broaden the exposure of people to science in general out there in society? As um, in a, a, one colleague in the UK who was concerned about the number of ethnic uh, minority children participating in science used to say, how can I aspire to what I've never seen, I, I've never actually been exposed to it, or how can I go where I've never been? in the sense of, you know, I've never really actually seen what it's like. So how can we give more opportunities to students to see uh, what this is like? Sorry. As their aspirations, uh, it measures their, their interest in a science-related career. Okay, that's what, that's what it measures. Uh, and again, this is something uh, reiterating to some extent what comes out of another slide which is that most students, this is UK data, but I, I, I'm not sure it would be that different anywhere else. Most students say, well, they like school science, they learn interesting things, parents think it's important, scientists do valuable work, science activities outside school, they do a lot of those. So there's an engagement in science out there. We, to some extent, as societies, are doing that kind of work, but we're not doing the job of converting it into the aspiration to be a scientist so strongly. Much smaller percentage. But again, is that sufficient? Or do you want to, to uh, more clamoring to be scientists in that kind of way? And what we find in the work that we've been doing in the UK is that the people who want to be a scientist, and this is some kind of concern, tend to, tend to be male. They've got, or, already got high or very high what you might call social or cultural capital. They're coming from the upper echelons of society. They tend to be Asian. Okay, more out of, in that sense. They're in top sets for science, and they've got a family member in the background. So those are, that's where we're getting the people from at the moment. And the question you've got to face is, is that where you want to get more people from? Okay, just, I mean, do you want to concentrate on that group, or do you want to uh, broaden the, the, the appeal? Now, one of the ways of broadening appeal is, and I just point this out because I went onto the BG website, and the nice thing on the BG website is that the picture that they have, that's the first one, is a woman actually doing en engineer. And for most engineering companies, that's quite unusual. So I think they are to be lauded and praised for that particular aspect. But, you know, you, these, it might seem a small issue, but again, it's about possibilities. If you never see a photograph of a woman as an engineer, why would you ever think of doing it in that kind of way? Uh, in that point of view. And so these thing are things that we do have to uh, think about and, and if you want to get what you might call a broader representation of people in, in society. Other thing I think we have to think about is careers, what I call, in and from scientists. science. I think, in some senses, teachers of science are responsible for a lot of this because they tend to say, well, do science because you can be, be a scientist. I had a student once who went and asked, went to, she went to a private girls' school in the UK where all these girls had done very well in their examinations at 16, including science, and she said, why have you chosen not to do science? And, she, and they said, well, if I do science, I'll have to be a scientist, and I don't want to do that. Now, I think we just need to re make people realize that actually doing science, doing mathematics, being numerate is helpful in all kinds of careers and actually makes you more employable. It opens more doors in that kind of way. So there's a problem in schools with the careers advice that we are giving. Okay. It needs to be broader in that sense. And so I think science teachers to some extent are ill-informed and we need a broader vision okay, altogether. That is, the issue is not careers in science but careers from science. And if you happen to go on a career in science, that's fine uh, in that kind, kind of way. Yeah. Uh, so what do I think that new kind of vision is? Well, one of the things I think that we need to focus on is that actually these are the five problems confronting humanity in the coming decades. All of those problems are going to need a contribution from science and technology to solve. It's not just science and technology, but they are going to make a significant contribution. In that sense, that makes okay, a scientific career a contribution to humanity, and it means that you are doing something for people. There's a kind of image that science has which is detached from people, and I think one needs to press that home a little bit more strongly so that people have that kind uh, of, of image and understanding that there is something worthwhile about sci scientific careers. 
And I think, so just to sort of finish, okay, and sum up what I'm really trying to say, I think, about engaging young people with science. It's interest that matters. All the research points to the fact that what carries you through the long, dark hours of studying some of the difficult aspects of science is that motivation and stimulus and interest. All of the people who interviewed in a Norwegian study doing undergraduate physics and asked why they were doing it, okay, it was, they pointed to the interest that had been generated early on. I want to argue that we have to have a broader vision of science. I know the pipeline is of concern to society, but that, I think, is only a minority of students. If you want to make science matter, you've got to have something which is, uh, communicates the excitement of science. What's the awe and wonder in it? And I don't think school science education does a sufficient job of communicating that. You know, the simple thing, for instance, which I'm often fond of citing, you know, there are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people on the planet. Think of that next time you kiss somebody. <laughs> you look like your parents because every cell in your body carries a chemically coded message about how to reproduce yourself. Isn't that amazing? They're all, fact, the science is full of ideas like that. We have to address the interests of girls if you want to uh, engage more of them. You've got to make stronger links outside the classroom to that technology aspect to make it seem meaningful and relevant. You've got to talk about careers from science, more if not as much as careers in science. And last but by no means the wider problem, I think, is we have to invest in good science teachers because it's the quality of teaching that makes the really big difference. Thank you very much. Obrigado, eh, Professor Osborne. Could you please join us here? E eu queria chamar o Professor Kellner também para se juntar aqui no painel. Queria começar destacando um aspecto, talvez uma vantagem adicional do estudo em ciências, que é que os nossos palestrantes se mantiveram absolutamente dentro do tempo das falas. Então, apesar da gente iniciar com atraso, a gente está entrando no horário nessa sessão de, de perguntas. Eu vou resistir um pouco à tentação do mediador de iniciar fazendo uma, né, comentários, já que a gente tem pouco tempo, vou abrir direto para vocês e, dependendo de como a coisa caminhar, eu posso apresentar uma outra questão aos nossos convidados. Queria pedir que, eu não sei se tem um microfone solto aí, que quem quiser é, fazer um comentário que seja bem objetivo ou uma pergunta também direcionada aqui ao painel, só fale nome, instituição, e eu vou pegar umas três perguntas e vou passar para os comentários dos nossos convidados. Uma pergunta para o professor Osborne, Amor Nanchaimovic, da Universidade de São Paulo. A última linha do último slide pode ser a chave do todo problema. Como você enfrenta esse problema? Uh, which problem is particularly The last the line of your last slide, slide, the yeah, teachers. Yeah. Teachers, did you teach us? Okay, okay. Obrigado. Outras perguntas ou comentários ali no fundo? Eu acho que não está... O microfone não está... Alô, agora está, né? Meu nome é Maria Lúcia Maciel, eu sou do Instituto Ciência Hoje. Eu queria chamar a atenção, eu achei muito interessante que quando o professor Osborne começou... Quer que eu fale inglês? Não, 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 não precisa, precisa não, né? é, Quando o professor Osborne começou a apresentação dele, ele disse, eu vou falar de uma coisa completamente diferente. E o que me chama a atenção é que, no fundo, quando a gente vê a essência das coisas... Eles falaram, o Alex e o, e o professor Oswald falaram exatamente da mesma coisa, do interesse das crianças na ciência. O que o Alex Kellner estava chamando atenção justamente foi 
como as crianças se interessam, desde que a gente ofereça a eles algo que lhes interesse. E o que o professor Osberg mostrou, todas as estatísticas indicam isso e terminam nessa essência que é o interesse das crianças pelo, pela, pela, pela ciência quando ela é bem apresentada. E particularmente me chamou a atenção, me surpreendeu, que o, o, o caso do Brasil, onde o número de o interesse das crianças é maior do que, por exemplo, na Inglaterra ou na Alemanha. Então, eu acho, só para completar, que a gente não pode nunca desistir de investir em programas como Mão na Massa e os programas da Ciência Hoje das Crianças, que estão espalhados aí pelo Brasil. O, o, o Ciência Hoje das Crianças está hoje em dia nas áreas de risco, né? aqui no Rio de Janeiro, por exemplo. O programa PSAI foi premiado com o Objetivos do Milênio, ano passado. Eu acho que a gente tem que investir nessas coisas e a ABC está cumprindo a sua missão de apoiar todas essas iniciativas. Obrigada. Obrigado. Eu, vou, eu tenho uma ali no fundo e depois eu vou passar para o senhor e a gente volta aqui para a mesa. To Professor Osborne, my name is Mauro Rebelo from the Rio de Janeiro University. I have two very uh, objective questions. I was concerned about the relationship between cause and effect in some of your slides. Uh, and my colleagues here, they, we were commenting the same thing. So what do you believe is the relationship with the influence of kind of instincts and biology in the preference of girls for some topics? Or, and what is the influence of culture in those same preferences? If, if there is a relationship, if you know about some of those relationships. And the other one was in the effect of PISA uh, results in the development of the country. If is the PISA result uh, a consequence or a cause of that development in, in that relationship that you showed? Thank you. Obrigado. Tem uma aqui, eu não consigo enxergar muito bem aquele fundo. Se tiver outras perguntas lá, não estou vendo. Passa, tem aqui, aqui, para o senhor tinha levantado. Aqui, aqui. aqui. O, no, Bras, no Brasil, a profissão de professor particularmente nas escolas públicas, tem uma valorização financeira e social muito baixa. Então, é difícil de imaginar como uma pessoa que muitas vezes se acha numa, numa profissão desvalorizada, possa entusiasmar os alunos para fazer o que ele está fazendo. É, eu, vou, eu vou passar aqui para eles, aí a gente vai coordenando, se houver tempo, eu abro uma nova série ou não, depende de como a gente estiver. É... Who would like to start? Uh, okay, there's a lot of questions there, so uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get them in the right order uh, in that sense. Uh, let me take the kind of teaching one uh, in, in that sense, and it's like I'm going to mix up answers to these questions. Uh, I do think the evidence about the quality of teaching is pretty rock solid in that sense from that point of view and that if you really do want to do something about schools uh, students experience in schools you've got to do something about the quality of teaching and invest in it if you look at what happens in Asian countries and if you look at Finland which is the country which is not the non-Asian country which does very well in Uh, PISA, they recruit very able people to be teachers, it's a competitive process, they train them well and they give them training, on, ongoing training on the job. So there has to be some kind of causal relationship there. Now, the kind of argument that my colleague Eric Hanischek makes, which doesn't go down well with teachers, but he's got a kind of legitimate point, 
is that really what you want to do is, uh, you, you know, it's too expensive in some senses to raise the ma all teachers, but what makes much better sense is to identify the, uh, the really poor teachers and make sure that they do not carry on in teaching. And he has a kind of argument that if you can do that, you would raise the performance significantly of the whole system in that kind of way. Now you can see the kinds of political complications about that kind of, uh, of argument. Nevertheless, it's taken seriously in the, in the US. And I, I, I just, my, my attitude is to this is some sense is I just think we are in this for, for the, the long term. You know, we are not going to change the attitudes of society to teachers overnight, but this kind of message needs to be hammered home and it needs to be hammered home hard so that policymakers realize that unless till you do something about this, you won't change the system. The, the other, uh, somebody was asking the question about uh, the cause and correlation uh, uh, relationship between the two. I didn't show you a slide, but actually uh, I took that one out because um, I can overwhelm people with too much data. Uh, but this is this slide shows that it makes that kind of relationship uh, is, is really powerful uh, when the GDP per capita is quite low. And going on to what you might call median GDP per cap capita, once you get to something like the United States, the, the quality of education is not making that much difference. You know, the United States has ways of addressing its problem, educational problems. Uh, in, 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 uh, in other ways. But it does, I think, make more of a difference in situations like, obviously, in Brazil, where you're in that kind of, I think, median level GDP per capita. And, the, the, you know, is it causal or is it uh, correlational? I mean, the answer is I don't think anybody really knows, but there's a link there that you can't ignore in that sense. And in pr you know, the, the, there can be no harm in improving the quality of your education system, so you might as well do it anyway, if you, if you see what I mean, even though uh, we don't... I mean, it makes based on all kinds of assumptions about future growth and potential uh, in that kind of way. As to the issue about girls uh, and whether... Uh, the, what, what's the best thing that we know about that? Well, if you look at the research, and there's a very extensive study on this, it basically, it, it, with one notable exception, well actually two notable exceptions, it basically says there's no difference in gender uh, performance on science and maths, uh, mathematics between girls and boys. The one exception to that is uh, there is research evidence that shows that girls, boys have stronger Spatial, spatial ability. They can do more of these kinds of mental manipulations of things readily. But girls, when trained, match their performance in, in that kind of way. There is a, one other study which measures girls' mathematical ability differently, which says there is a difference. I think the fundamental difference, though, is why are more girls going into the life sciences and biology? Is because, as I showed you, what their concerns and interests are, it's because biology addresses those more. And uh, the physical sciences have to construct a narrative about how it is that they are about life <laughs> as much as they are about the inert objects uh, of the world. I think I'll pass over now. Eu 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 confesso a vocês que sempre que a gente fala um pouco sobre qual é realmente o principal aspecto que pode influenciar o maior o menor maior ou menor fator a questão da educação científica em qualquer país não, não, não vamos mentir para a gente, a gente sabe o que é é exatamente aquilo que foi apresentado com relação aos professores nós sabemos disso, mas não sabemos disso não, já sabemos disso há, há muito tempo, e o que que acontece pelo menos aí falando da nossa sociedade em termos de Brasil o que que a gente consegue realmente influenciar para mudanças, eu acho que houveram algumas mudanças mas é evidente que se você não tiver uma situação onde você, pelo menos, dê 
dignidade para essas pessoas, que vão ensinar para os nossos filhos alguma coisa vinculada, não digo da sua paciência, mas especificamente, especificamente na minha paciência, é evidente que o ensino vai ser de baixa qualidade e o interesse que você vai despertar em cima dessas, dessas crianças, dos nossos filhos, vai diminuir bastante, é evidente. E mesmo assim, a gente, por algum motivo ou outro, a gente não consegue dar esse, esse salto. Eu vou, eu vou dar um, um, um rápido exemplo de uma situação que eu vivi agora há pouco tempo atrás. Por um motivo, é, 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 não interessa comentar aqui, eu estive agora na Austrália. Eu estive numa ocasião onde o primeiro ministro australiano estava condecorando três pesquisadores, que me deixou bastante satisfeito, infelizmente não era nenhum deles, mas esse é outro assunto. Mas ele também estava de, é, condecorando dois professores do ensino fundamental em ciências. Quer dizer, olhem só a imagem que esse Estado está dando para os professores e, por que não dizer, para a juventude. O, a pessoa mais importante do ponto de vista político, condecorando professores. É, é realmente algo, são esses, esse tipo de iniciativas que eu imagino que podem fazer que alguma, que alguma coisa mude no nosso país. Também um outro ponto que eu sempre gosto de frisar, é que, à medida que eu penso nesses assuntos, eu não acho que exista um, um único remédio. Não existe uma, uma única coisa que você possa fazer que você vai resolver todo o problema. Infelizmente ou felizmente, são diversas atitudes que você tem que tomar em diferentes linhas, observando-se, inclusive, a gente não gosta muito de falar isso, mas diversas é, 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 situações regionais onde você pode incentivar mais ou menos pessoas para a ciência, dependendo da situação onde eles vivem. Eu acho que você tentar, atrasar pra, é, tentar trazer para dentro da sala de aula problemas do cotidiano dessas pessoas e que é onde a solução reside no avanço científico e tecnológico, você vai interessar essas pessoas, essas crianças todas, para o desenvolvimento científico. Você vai despertar o interesse delas. E um outro fator que eu também acho importante, que a gente é, deve salientar, que o objetivo principal, pelo menos da forma com que eu vejo, não é necessariamente de fazer mais cientistas. É claro que isso é desejável. Mas mesmo que a gente não consiga fazer mais cientistas, eu acho que um, um, um outro objetivo, pelo menos, tão importante quanto, é despertar a consciência da importância da ciência para essas crianças que, em, é, em mais ou menos tempo, passaram a liderar o nosso país. Seja político, seja empresário, seja se tornando, enfim, ativo em diversos segmentos da sociedade. E o fato de você expor essas crianças para a importância da ciência, eu acho que você vai contribuir a médio e longo prazo para uma uma, uma difusão melhor e uma percepção melhor da ciência para a sociedade como um todo. E, novamente, né, eu sempre acho que se você puder, de alguma forma, fazer qualquer iniciativa onde você procure é, abrir um pouco os horizontes, sair, inclusive, da sala de aula, seja por diversas atividades, eu acho que você vai estar tá realmente auxiliando um pouquinho nessa... nessa Nesse verdadeiro desafio que é o desenvolvimento da ciência. Obrigado. A gente não terá tempo para uma outra rodada. Eu convido a quem tiver uma questão, tente contrabandeá-la para a próxima sessão. Antes de, de liberar vocês para, o, para um café, eu só queria dar um rápido recado, que é, inicialmente o plano é que a gente tivesse nesse bloco uma palestra do Jorge Guimarães, presidente da CAPES, mas em função de problemas de agenda, ele não pode estar conosco, como vocês perceberam. É, agradeço muito as apresentações dos professores e, e convido vocês para um café que está sendo servido agora. Em 15 minutos a gente retorna. Muito obrigado.